Okay, so we're going to start. Now, the whole idea of this final plenary is that uh, we, in the sort of big-headed way that we've done it all day, we've, we've, we've sort of lined up people who are queuing up to say what a great organisation Near Media Co-op is. But this is your chance now to deflate us and debunk all of that nonsense. And we want, we want uh, questions, challenging questions, pr suggestions, proposals on, from your experiences, how media and how community media and how near media particularly can, can improve and up its game. So the floor is open. If you have any further questions, queries to us on how we run the operation uh, or suggestions on how we might improve things. Okay, I think Pat without a microphone is there, right. Seeing as I had the microphone all morning and didn't get to speak uh, through it, I said I'd, I'd grab it first this afternoon. Uh, just a suggestion. I know we do. We have had uh, at Near over the past two years a uh, intercultural section project, call it what you will. But we're probably as guilty as any other uh, mainstream media in that we, when we invite uh, ethnic people from ethnic minority backgrounds to partake uh, in program making, it's only about ethnic minority issues that they should really be asked, I mean, what's the, they have opinions on all, a whole range of things, and if we're really going to move ahead of the game, which they're not doing in the mainstream media, it will mean having people, say, say for example, disabled people on to talk about issues other than disability, and people from ethnic minorities to talk about issues other than those relating specifically to ethnic minorities. That's okay. my point. Okay. okay, anybody want to? She's off, she's off. Her. Brace yourself now, she's off. I agree completely with what Pat just said. I think that migrants and uh, ethnic minorities, all minorities, should have a voice in all issues because uh, obviously people who is living in Ireland has the same words that we have about public service codes, uh, tax, etc., etc. But in relation to that, to this, that specific uh, project or a specific projects, we find that the, the difficulty is that the people who are funding the projects actually are pushing us to do those programs, okay? So for example, we run this intercultural dialogue through community media, and the initial plan was that we were training the people and then they will actually join teams and programs that were already broadcasting, and that they, were, they would be interested in the content and then bring their own point of view, because we believe interculturalism is about that. It's about talking from different experiences. But for in this case, the funder, who was, which was Pobol, actually told us, no, we want these people to produce a program about intercultural issues. So really, I think <clears throat> when it, came, it comes to the, that's what I was saying before, when you put in place a program, you're better off talking to the people who has the experience and who is doing it at ground, is doing the groundwork because they know better, but in this case, it's this directive that is coming from the top telling us, no, you have to do it this way. And the project itself was very good, but I think it failed from the point of view that we couldn't really mainstream that interculturalism into the, the whole programming. And really, that's what we are aspiring to do. Okay, and Pat, Pat, just to say, we have experimented with that, not enough, I agree. I'm just harking back to when we did Refugee Radio and we actually, in theory, handed over the radio station to refugees, asylum seekers, and they were told whatever programs you want to make, some of them made religious programs, some of them played music, others did sports, uh, but I think it was important in that it showed that people who are immigrants or refugees weren't as one-dimensional as most media would portray them. Uh, but I, I agree in that we have... In our defence, we have we've had, we've dipped into it and experimented with it, but we haven't done it enough and it's consistently enough. So I do think it's a, it's a valid criticism that we can look at. Brian Green, I think down the back wanted to ask something. Yeah, you do. Oh, you're loud, yeah. It's for the podcast, is it? Uh, Brian Green, DC TV. I think you're doing the radio very well, the TV, the internet and now we see the drama as well. Um, I think and I feel from what Sally said earlier on, you're going on to do more things. And I'd love to hear from Sally more detail on you know, what it is you're planning to do and that building that you're looking for. What are your next plans? Because I think you have something up your sleeve and I want to hear about it. We haven't spoken to the credit union yet. <laughs> Mr. Yes, you. Sorry, go grab the microphone. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll take it. 
I need the microphone. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thank you. The, uh, what we are planning is something, it's an experience that we have seen in other European countries where really community radios have developed into community media. And uh, we are, for example, if uh, I can talk about my experience of visiting a community radio station in Linz in Upper Austria called Fro, and they have this building that uh, uh, basically is uh, a three story building by the Danube. It's beautiful there. But uh, on the ground floor, they have a space that is an open space. And all, basically, what it does is it's a bar, but also it's a theater, and it's also a geek venue, so new bands from the locality can go and play. And it also uh, helps the radio stations to, to fundraise for, for their activities. Then they have the radio station, obviously, and then the top floor is shared with other organizations. Our vision is more is similar to that. We would like to have a space that, where we could have the drama, our drama group, but also all other drama groups from the from the north, north the, from Dublin, the north side of Dublin, using the facility, so we could have drama nearly uh, twice or three times a week for the local community. We could also project movies. Why not? Uh, we can invite the new groups that are coming now already to the radio station to the sessions to play there, live gigs. Obviously, we want also to at the moment we are in two buildings and four different offices. So it's really very difficult for us to interact. It's like radio is in one place, television is in another place, the IT center is in another place. And it will be, if we work together, we will be, it will be easier for us to think of other ways that we can incorporate the different techniques and experience to produce something new. But also to consider um, maybe that when people come to do the training, they don't, don't only want to know about the radio station. They may want to know about the, the other possibilities too. So I think it will be good for production, but also to, for training and for access for the community, because at the moment also the building we are is great, but it's a bit restrictive in what it comes to access because uh, it's close at four. So if you're not really a volunteer or you're a guest to a program, you can really come to the radio station. So we are looking for something that will be more accessible for people that may be working nine to five and then they want to come to meet people at the radio station later on too. So it will be our own space, we'll be responsible for it, but it will be an open space for everyone. Sorry. Took Sorry, it's, it sounds like the OKC uh, building in East Wall. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yes, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think there would be synergies. I mean, we're, we're scattered. There's no interaction to any great people meet occasionally, try to phone people. We just think that if we can get everything on the one roof, it would, we would be able to offer an improved service to the community. That's, that's the plan. But it's at a very early stage. We haven't identified a premises or the funding yet. Uh, okay, I, I've been just reminded that I didn't introduce, I'm remiss, it's just late in the day and maybe the brain is slowing down. Uh, on my left, and maybe I say my extreme left, is uh, Sally, Sally Dad Galliana, uh, is uh, radio uh, coordinator for the project. Vincent Teeling is the chair of the Near Media Cooperative. Heidi Bedell is the vice chair of the Near Media Cooperative. And appropriately, to my right, is uh, Peter Cunningham, who's the treasurer of uh, the Near Media Cooperative. And I think you've seen enough of me without any more introductions. Okay, have we any more voices? Uh, down here, sorry, yeah, and over there. Okay, down here first, uh, uh, Dorothy. Hi, um, I'm a recent convert to community uh, radio. I've only just done okay. the course up in uh, County Leitrim. And um, it's not, I don't think I've gone around with my eyes closed before. I, I live in a field, so I haven't been, I'm not in the earshot of a community radio. So it's just, what do you do and what can you do? So people like me that mightn't have come across it through my local women's group, how do we, how do we reach the people that don't even know about community radio yet and it's available on the internet? 
Well, first of all, uh, we have a schedule there of our current programming. If you get a look at that, you'll see how varied it is. But it, I mean, we have other community radio stations here who maybe started after we did. So it's a slow build in terms of programming, in terms of finding people and the resources to and the ideas for programs. But we have a full schedule of programming now. But we're well, the radio station is 50 in years on air, so it takes it's a slow build to get a, a full schedule that is a service. To, to people in the area, uh, that's that's the radio. I mean, the ethos of it is to be accessible, democratic, not for profit, uh, and and to provide an alternative service uh, to that provider. In your area, you'd have you'd have local commercial radio as well as public service radio. Uh, we we believe there are limitations to both of those services. Uh, community radio gives us the flexibility to experiment with programming, and a lot of the stuff we've been talking about here today is very experimental and we're innovating and trying different ways to develop content. People working in commercial media or public service media, even if they were in, had an intent to do it, don't have the freedom to do it. So community radio, first and foremost, is really a blank slate. And it, you can fill it with which, whatever you want to imagine. And that's what we try to do in NEAR, to be imaginative, challenge ourselves and try to develop programming that's appropriate to that ethos and is beneficial to the community. And several surveys we've done of listeners in the area say people really do appreciate it. And sometimes I know I tend to keep shouting we need to do more human rights and environmental programs. But it is encouraging to see that when we do the survey, local listeners indicate that they really do appreciate a, a community service in their area, talking seriously, not in sound bites or in dramatics, just real serious discussion about human rights issues, social justice, the environmental issues. So we seem to have struck the a model that's working and is appreciated by people in the area. And certainly your own area, I hope you're going back now to launch a project up there. And we'd be very happy to help out on that, okay? And outreach, okay. Well, yes, of course. Uh, where's Dorothy? Dorothy is our outreach person there. Yeah, we do a lot of that. We we we, we do believe that a radio station, our our radio, our franchise is North East Dublin. There's about two hundred thousand people in it, so it's a big, big enough, populous area, uh, and we feel that. Just by chance, the studio was based in Coolock. It, it was where the premises just became available to us. But it's a long distance from people in other parts of our catchment area. So we've developed outreach activities through Dorothy, and we go out to communities, and we find we have an OB van, and we go out to their activities. So we celebrate with people their events out in the area, and it raises the profile of Near FM, but it also means that we're out in the community. We often say that our studios are not the couple of rooms in Coolock. Dublin North East is our studio. And that's the sort of ethos we work with. Are you happy with that? Okay. She's giving out to me here. Uh, okay, any more? Somebody over here wants to ask a question? Was there somebody over here for us? Yeah, sorry. Uh, first of all, thanks to everyone for a very successful uh, event today. Um, some time ago, I heard this story, and it's about this guy who went off to a dark person, uh, a dark looking person like myself, and he said, say something in your own language. And the guy paused, and he said, what do you want me to say? That's in English. Now, it happened that uh, the guy he was asking was from the Caribbean, so English is the language he speaks. Now, in my own uh, experience, I was walking along the road one day, I seemed to be in a dream state, and this guy came up it must look like he had been probably had half a, a pint too many, and he said, are you a refugee? And I was uh, uh, taken, and I have nothing against, and I uh, sympathize with people who find themselves in that position. And I said, not yet. <laughs> now, I never close off the uh, possibility that I might be in that situation. Now, I give these two examples because Lots of times we kind of uh, tend to, you know, have ideas of uh, what things should be, and I just want to link this to what Pat said earlier on about the whole thing about ethnic minorities, multi uh, interculturalism, and there was Sally was saying that the pressure on the funders to uh, say do this. Now I would have thought such an approach would be more like prescriptive than uh, saying, okay, right. We want to reflect what is going on. Now, is there a way you can tell us how we can reflect that without saying, okay, this is 
something called multiculturalism, interculturalism, or diversity. And so we want you to go and do a program on that. Now, uh, back uh, home in Ghana, where we had the uh, misfortune of being a British colony, well, good in the sense that we have the English language. So I grew up, you know, reading Shakespeare and uh, 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 like uh, Yeats. And people are surprised that when we come to here, we have something in common. So what I, what I, I just want to uh, say is that, is it not like with uh, community radio, try to challenge the conventions of how we see somebody, rather than say, okay, right, we start off as being human beings. I mean, imagine if we have to speak in different languages. We can't, uh, you know, understand each other. So, uh, can we not then challenge the whole thing about interculturalism by saying, what do we have in common? And from that commonality, what are the uh, uh, different diversities? So, I just want to put this across that, how can community radio take subjects and say that, well, we have something in common, but we want to uh, 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 approach that commonality in various forms and um, see uh, uh, what the result will be. So I just, you know, I thought, put that. Okay. Okay, Peter, Heidi, Vincent, anybody want to take that? You take that. Um, we've debated an awful lot of things now on, uh, at our board meetings and stuff, and one of the things which I've, I concluded at one point was that we couldn't take on the responsibilities of trying to solve an awful lot of the disparities that are out in society and, and a lot of the issues that need to be covered, but that what is extremely important is that we're there as a conduit when other people think of ideas or programs that I feel this needs to be said or this needs to be shown in a certain way or these people are being portrayed as one group and I'd like the truth to be out there or I'd like to give an alternative to it and that we facilitate that and that we never put up blocks that say, no, you, you know, you can't, that's, that's wrong, that's not the way society, well, nobody will accept that or it challenges too much. So that the ideas couldn't, aren't necessarily required to come from the organisation to address the inequalities, but that we're there, that if, the, if ideas come from the people who are, are very often the victims of inequality, that we are here with the equipment, with the expertise, with the training, and with the time and energy to facilitate that broadcast so that we mediate, we're the middle bit, if you like, between the solutions and the problems. Um, so for me, that's, that's, so I don't have a, an answer really, how can, we how can we do what you're asking, but only that we hear and that if, the, as more solutions come out, and I do really believe that all the minds, the more, more people you can involve, the more likely you are to hit on some really good solutions. Um, that that's what we're here for. That's our purpose, really. Okay, Thank, thanks, Heidi. Uh, uh, Aon, sorry? Okay, we don't want a dialogue now. Sure. You know, uh, what I was trying to say is that, okay. see, uh, it was more uh, in response to what Sally was saying, yes. that, uh, like Pobal is saying, that, oh, reflect something interculturalism. So, as uh, 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 Jack That's himself okay. was saying, like a refugee group will say, will say, well, let's do a program on music, rather than saying, let's do a program yeah. on how refugees are treated. And that's, no, I, that's I, what I, I'm saying. I think that. we take your point, and I think we know that we're not doing enough of that, and I think we'll give a commitment here that we will look at developing that, that we won't be ghettoizing people around these sort of stereotypes. I think that's a fair point made, okay. Oh, Aon, did you want to ask a question over there? Uh, thanks very much. I suppose my question is about the nature of how social discourse and political discourse has changed, and we live in a, a soundbite era. And the, you know, the, the challenge for you know, politicians or for campaigners or for NGOs is to get their message into a very short snippet, into a soundbite. And I, what I want to ask is, you know, how do you meet that challenge, and how do you ensure that there's proper analysis of often very nuanced and complex you know, discussion points. I mean, even the challenge of social media, in my view, is that, you know, people who are trying to put a point of view across have to do so in 140 characters in a Twitter uh, posting. And you can't really engage in a proper in-depth way without sort of, you know, being very careful about you know, <laughs> your use of the characters and all the rest of it. So my point is that 
where does the where does the sort of the how can you still hold the attention of the public because that's what media is, media is trying to do now with sound bites, but how can you ensure that there's proper analysis of issues around social justice of traveller rights, immigrant rights, and all the other things that people here feel so strongly about. Thanks. Am I on? No. I'm on now. It, well, this is something that uh, sort of exercised us uh, on when we were starting up. And what we've tried to do is, is to allow just more time. And I think we've, we've tried to s swim against this uh, stream of uh, sound bites. And, and people listening to media tend to have become used to that model. But I think we risked doing more reflective longer pieces uh, and we find quite often when there's a, a, a debate the person initially being interviewed or in a debate will nearly speak in sound bites to get their idea across because they've almost been trained to speak like that this is even local people so when you go back around the second time to talk it becomes more nuanced and reflective and people start thinking a little deeper beyond their own sound bites uh, and there's no science to it it's just a case of giving people the space to reflect, to listen to somebody else's responses and c to come back. Now, we do ask that people are civilised because we know quite often the discussions are dealing with issues that are contentious, but I think the model of community media and discourse that we're trying to develop is a model where we allow space for civilised disagreement even, but where people even themselves start to question their own initial soundbite comment uh, and it's 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 a sort of an education, self-education. I don't know if that explains to you, but that's the model we're trying to develop. That we provide, and the listeners seem to be staying with us. This is the proof of the pudding: is that listeners, when we do surveys, people like the model of discourse on Near FM. So. We're clearly tapping into a, a, a yearning by people to get a little bit more information than just the nuanced sound bites that most mainstream media provide them with. Anybody? I think there's a, it's a really interesting question how we not only, uh, you, you made reference to the whole idea of these being 140 characters and so on and so forth and the sound bite element, but uh, trying to encourage a dialogue uh, a two-way system of communication, uh, which is probably the area of the media co-op that interests me most. It's not really what we necessarily transmit out, but what the return we get back. But I think today, in lots of ways, uh, is, a, is a perfect example of why uh, committee and management ne needs to sit back and uh, you know, assess and take the viewpoint from the experts in lots of ways in the room today and uh, on how we approach that whole area because I was hoping uh, sitting here today that I'm, I, well, I was hoping that I was going to be, uh, there was going to be an onslaught of things that we're not doing correctly because it, committee and management, well it can be in its own bubble as well, the committee, you know, committee and management can be in their own bubble trying to operate the organisation. Uh, moving forward, so that's a very interesting point, and bring them on. Can, can okay, sorry, Sally. Very brief. Just briefly now, because we... Yeah. Well, basically, we don't do some bites, as Jack was saying. In fact, for example, from the European uh, Union and the, the European Parliament and the European Commission uh, press offices, they sent us some bites that are basically 20 seconds of an MEP saying something. Uh, we don't have a space for that. In our, we, we don't do some bites we tell stories so if we want to highlight something that is happening it have to be properly explained so basically uh, i think that that some bite approach is very much about consumer uh, consume uh, consumerism is media that we sell and because we have different listeners we give 20 seconds of this here and 20 seconds of something different there just to keep people listening in our case we try to be informative we try to tell a story which is different Okay, we're, we're nearly there, and we have a declaration to affirm. So, anybody else? Any more? Joe, I see Joe down there, and then we have someone over here. Okay. Uh, do we think that we're doing enough to uh, promote the uh, cooperative model of the like the co cooperative models in general, so that not only in the media? Cooperations, but in um, the likes of food co-ops, and I don't. I 
don't think we've actually done an in-depth visit to the co-op at any time and um, see how we're doing over there. And we're still 30 years ago on as well. Yeah, but did you visit us? I'm here, all, yeah. I'm here every Monday. <laughs> I'm joking. No, you're absolutely right. But maybe that's why I'm flagging that the, the next 10 years are declared uh, the decade of the cooperative development. And you can bank on it that part of our strategic plan is now to, to promote and uh, encourage and highlight the, the value of cooperatives. As Noel Cunningham earlier was saying, the credit union is a really good example of how people can collaborate in a financial way. We are doing it with media. They're both very important aspects. And of course, as Joe is right, food is the most important uh, thing and uh, human right we have. So we, we do need to highlight because they're really important, not just for the service each of these cooperatives offer, but it's more the ethos of people working together, planning and working collectively for, for their own, for a collective social benefit. I think it's a really important model where most of the world and most of the commercial media talk about individual consumerism and you know be on your own and don't be worrying about everybody else the cooperative model absolutely challenges that and offers a counter view and i think it's you're right joe we need to spend the next couple of years promoting cooperatives because i think citizens i think are ready i think people are fed up with the current model of uh, the capitalist narrow capitalist uh, uh, narrative and people are ready for a story we we have a good story cooperatives have a good story and we need to start telling it I, was there somebody down here want to yeah oh. okay just one more, just very quick. The real success of cooperatives comes from the voluntary aspects of, co of cooperatives where people work to in service to others. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing that we should be promoting and promoting it very well. Rather okay, than I think you're right. Well, I mean, I think NEAR is a good example uh, of a huge volunteer base, uh, people working collectively to, to promote their, their media cooperative. Somebody down here, yeah. Over the, sorry, back there, Dorothy. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we should say, yeah. I will. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Open. Shouldn't be sorry, involved in sorry. radio at all. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, I, I know you're inside your bubble looking out and wondering what it's like, uh, the view from the other side. And I'm very conscious that a lot of the people here are probably local and to some degree uh, stakeholders in the locality. Um, we're visitors. Um, I'm with a, a startup community radio that's based in South Donegal, North Leitrim, somewhere near the field uh, that um, uh, Orla is, is hoping to be able to get some transmission into. Um, and when we, we're, we're a cooperative as well. So, um, and I think it is important. I think it's a, it, it's a whole other discussion around community radio. I think there have been, a, I think the, uh, the, uh, the model of company limited by guarantee in, very, in many, many ways works against the ethos of what community radio should be about. So it's a wrong fit, but that's a different discussion for, a different, for another day. But um, as we were developing our project, um, you know, you look around and you look at um, ideas of community radio that you would aspire to. So th the reason I personally am here today is that Near FM is sort of our top shelf. So when people ask me sort of what idea do we have of what we would like to aspire to, there, and there are lots of community radios, and I have uh, the, one, the one that I say I would most like us to be like is near FM. I won't today tell you which is the one I would quietly say I would least like to be, to aspire to. Um, because I think, uh, you know, I, I don't know whether Jack is aware, but he, he, he's kind of sometimes known, you know, uh, as the father of community radio. Yeah, well, I was going to say, you're probably glad that it's not the grandfather, but you're still kind of referred to as the daddy of community radio. Um, so I think whatever you are doing in terms of uh, being stakeholders and gatekeepers of the ethos of community radio and, and, and being able to change and respond rapidly, in fact, in many ways, to new technologies is working. So um, if it's not broken, I would say, don't fix it. Um, and the very first question that was asked, I think as well, it just brings a challenge just in, in today's discussion around social justice media. It's one that we struggle with, is how do you um, make sure that you don't get wise? I know it was mentioned in, in terms of asylum seekers, but I think it applies as well uh, to gender, for example. You know, we're looking to see how do we get women involved in making radio, not how do we get women involved in making women's programs. 
how do we get young people involved in dialogues that are not just about young people? They have opinions and they have things to contribute to dialogues that are not just about youth. So I suppose it's that whole thing with um, travellers. Why, why can't travellers be involved in radio that's not just about? So I suppose the next, the progression on from participation, uh, whereas giving a voice to things that are in the first instance important to them, but then, uh, is it Hi Heidi or Hillary? Sorry. Uh, you know, how, how do community radios get beyond being just responsive to somebody coming along and saying, this is the idea we have, and how do you actually sort of change the ideas? Because radio is very formulaic, mm. and people have an idea that this is what radio should be, and maybe we should be showing them. Maybe it's part of the long-term thing of media literacy, not showing pe people how to consume radio, but how to look at a different product. And, and uh, you know, so that's just my thoughts okay, in general. Okay, thanks. thanks. And thanks for the kind words. But I would say you're absolutely right. We still haven't cracked the formulaic way to do it. We're, I think we're still doing it in a very formulaic way. And this is because people coming in to do community media have been influenced by mainstream media. So it's, it's a big nut to crack. We haven't, and we haven't cracked it yet. Now we're going to wrap it up fairly soon because Peter has the declaration that they've been working on. He needs to read it. So unless anybody has another pertinent question, uh, we're going to get the bar open so we can give you all a drink. So there's somebody down here, yeah. This is the last question now. Okay, last question. I'm, f I'm from Cork, so normally I start with a song, but I, I, I leave you off to know this evening. Uh, Gerard and I travelled from Limerick and Tipperary from the Midwest, and uh, good to hear people came from Donegal as well. Uh, you are quite impressive. 30 years is pretty decent. We're adolescents. We're just 13, like. Um, the official name for the company we are part of is uh, Changing Ireland Community Media Limited. So we're the print version of... We're not really. We're, we are and we aren't. We use, um, we promote community development and we adhere as much as possible to uh, community development principles and practices. Uh, my question for you is, uh, we've come here, when are you going to come down to my Ross and talk to us about collaboration? Thank you. Okay, thanks. That sounds like a, an invitation we'll, we'll take you up on. Okay. Liam, last question. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you sleep all evening. You're only waking up now. I well, heard the bar was opening. <laughs> now, I have to say a couple of words on behalf of Crail because I'm the voice and Mary is the Congratulations to Near FM in the last 30 years. I think you have really, a, to echo what Miriam said, a role model to community, community, community media in, in Ireland. And you brought an awful lot to the table and you've rolled out and helped stations especially the one I'm in uh, last year, and I thank you for that. Um, that's on behalf of Crail. From the station's point, from my personal station's point of view, I want to thank you for the help that you gave us last year and the advice that you always give and you do give to other community stations. What I'd love to know is, the last 30 years, what was your biggest achievement? And for the next 30 years, what do you think your biggest challenge will be? Who says to me? To anybody. Okay. anybody. Well, my biggest achievement was the first meeting I called out in the uh, defunct uh, hotel. It was up the road here. Uh, I called a meeting to try and launch community radio. 50 community organizations promised me they would be there. I went off with my job. I was a sales rep down to Wexford. Spent my evenings, instead of drinking in the bar, up in my b bedroom writing a, an inspiring speech. Came back to the hotel sat with the podium like this, 50 chairs. I said to the hotel man, don't put out too many. We'll go about 50 chairs. Nobody turned up. Not one person turned up. So I read the speech to the empty room and said, Sodges, you missed a good speech. So for me, the, the highlight of the last 30 years was the next meeting, one lad turned up who was a techie, and he liked the idea of radio, so I felt I was increasing, what, 100%. So, uh, it's all downhill after that, Liam. And for the next 30 years, I'm going to be paying the arse to them here because I keep wanting to do new things. I'm still entirely dissatisfied with what we're doing with alternative media. I think that's what I was saying this morning. The model we have is only at the larval stage. We, we, it, it's, it's really only still taking shape. And, it, and this is the beauty of the opportunity given to us. We, we have 
the opportunity that people in commercial media and public service media, we have a real opportunity to shape media and the new media to be as it is merging and evolving, we can be right there at the coalface shaping it to suit us and our communities. So that's my aspiration for the next 30 years. I won't be around, but I'll wish as well from wherever I am. Well, I, 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 sorry, sorry. No, no, well, you're grabbing that. Sorry, I'm going to have to be the chair. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. I thought somebody. Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Peter. Peter Cunningham, you're going to uh, first read around here. <laughs> okay. Peter Cunningham uh, has been working on the declaration material that came in online and that you contributed here this evening. So, Peter, I hand over. The, the idea is that this is not, we're not going for amendments and uh, clauses. It's a, 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 this is culled from all of your material with the best of intentions. I want affirmation for it, okay. We're calling it the Parnell uh, Declaration, so Parnell will be happy wherever he is. So just listen to it uh, and affirm it and we'll get the bar open, okay. <laughs> That's the way to sell a declaration. Just to confirm what Jack's been saying, uh, we have taken what we think is consensus viewpoints on all the feedback we've received both today and over the last week or so in relation to the formation of the declaration. So we think we are reflecting the opinions of people who are here and people who even aren't here but who have contributed to the Declaration anyway, so hopefully you've got it right. So, The Parnell Declaration on Social Justice Media. All media must ensure that all people shall be treated equally and through broadcasting and education shall promote issues of human rights and equality and take appropriate measures to ensure the prioritisation of the same. So that's what we've come up with from the feedback that you have all given us. So I suppose the idea is to take a show of hands, an affirmation. an affirmation from the floor. If people are happy with that, I can read it again if people want me to read it again. Otherwise, are, 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 if people are happy, yeah, yeah. show of hands. Happy with that affirmation or declaration. Okay, I think that's adopted okay. then. Adopted. Great. Again. Okay. <laughs> okay, you finish. Um, you have the microphone now, we can't get it off. Well, I, I am... No, no, no changes out in the declaration. Go on. Community media in terms of their approach, or well, you I don't know, did just see that in? No, see, that's, this is the distilled wisdom. Of the, come on, we have to go. That's the distilled wisdom. Sorry, okay. No, you but in, to, in terms Sorry. of a, a, a community development input into. We, we agree with everything yeah. you're saying, but that's the distilled wisdom of the participants. Come on. We're, we're, we're kind of running out of time, and I, we, I will talk, I'll talk to you later. Later on, about we'll get it in. Listen, uh, I just wanted to, as the chair of the Near Media Co-op. Uh, thank you all for your input today. It's been really valuable. It's fuel. It's fuel for the committee of management, and it fuels us as we move forward and uh, gives us a good reason for meeting all the time and doing what we do. So I want to thank you. It is our 30th anniversary. I, I was around uh, on day one, or fairly close to it, and I was very young then. But however, the, young that up. Uh, the point about it is, is that uh, it is very rare we do this, but I just want to thank Jack for everything that he's given to community media in the last 30 years and all the assistance he gives to the committee today. And thank you. And thanks to Parnells. Thanks to the Credit Union for the help today as well. And uh, thank you to, to you all. Thank you. And thank you to Dorothy, who was the main drive, driver force be behind organizing everything. So. Okay, thanks. That's it, folks. Uh, thanks for your attendance and safe home. Okay, thanks very much.